Hello, am I now working? There you are. Now I can hear you. Hello. Thank you. How do you do? Thank you, Rob. Um, nice to meet you. Um, for the moment, it's working fine, but I don't have a proper internet. I tether off a phone. So if there's any lag, I'm going to have to sh ask us both to shut the video down. It's just audio because I, I'm tethering no, off no. a phone. To totally understand. And, and no problem. And if it works out... Uh, 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 you know, we can also schedule for maybe a better day or better no, no. internet. I know how that goes. I live in the mountains. So, it's you know, it, it would simply be a case of um, shutting the video down and just talking on audio because I'm tethering no, off a phone. Not, I get low bandwidth messages regularly. Okay. No Thank problem. You. Not a problem. Well, so so let me understand. Is it um, is it Leonard or or Robert? The email comes across as Robert Skinner. So. That's why I've asked. Yes, yes, but unfortunately the Zoom is stuck on Leonard, and I don't know how to change it. I had to log on oh. <laughs> using Leonard on a particular site. Oh, okay. They there wouldn't accept a... anything other yeah, than Leonard no because the number was got for me by somebody else who was Leonard. And so it's now... It didn't Zoom didn't work. Yeah, I deleted it from my laptop. I put it back on, and, and I, I couldn't... I don't know how to change... So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Leonard's following you around, huh? <laughs> well, it's difficult. <laughs> um, I'm yeah, very... No, no problem. I totally understand the technology of today's. But look, at it makes it pretty wonderful. Here you are in the UK. Uh, I'm in the Rocky Mountains, and, uh, you know, we're able to connect and see each other. That's a... Okay. Quite a, quite a world different from what we grew up in, huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, it's quite amazing. Um... It, it is. So, uh, sorry. Oh, have you. you been associated with witnesses before, or never, or any of that? Never. I used nope. to be a oneness Pentecostal, also known as an apostolic or Jesus only. Uh huh. Have okay, you heard of understood. them? Have you heard of no, them? No, I haven't. I, I, I've heard of the apostolic uh, Pentecostals, but I haven't That's heard it. of. Well, I was from California. That's it. So, apostolic Pentecostal. But I it's got lots of different yeah, names. Yeah, I hadn't heard of Jesus. Jesus only is yeah, also the <laughs> Jesus only has many names. It's known as Apostolic Pentecostal or Apostolic Oneness or Oneness or Jesus only. So that is my background. I left many many years ago. Did you? Okay. Bible student yourself though, or do you just like reading the Bible, or? Yes, I'm a Bible student myself, but I don't attend any any fellowship. I gave up many years ago. Awesome, awesome. No, I can I can understand. We we meet a lot of individuals like yourself um, that uh, really really struggle with the organized religion and and the outlook of that in today's right. world and a lot of the troubles that seem to surround them as well. Yes. So can definitely understand that. Um. How did you uh, hook up with us here in Evergreen? Um, somebody suggested I should speak to you um, here. They said you would be able to help because when I've spoken to people in the UK, beside the JW carts, they just tell me go to JW.org and do some research. So they said that you would be more helpful, and they gave me the code. Um, but... Um, <laughs> What really no, puzzles? No, no, no problem. And happy to happy to address your question. If, if you wouldn't mind, just give me a little bit a little background how you got to that kind of question, and then I'll just let you know a little bit of what we believe on it. Right. Do you want me just to tell you the question? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, Matthew twenty four verse three uses the word presence, not coming. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately, saying, "Tell us." When will these things be, and what will, be, what will be the sign of your presence and of the conclusion of the system of things? That's Matthew 24, 3 in the um, uh -huh. Silver New World Translation. Yes. Which I've oh, got a, you got one. a copy of that. Nice. Um, whereas when I looked it up in eight, I've got a parallel Bible with eight different versions. Uh -huh. Seven of the versions read His Coming, that's the King James, Today's English Version, New International, Phillips, Revised Standard Version, Jerusalem and New English Bible, all read um, the sign of your coming. 
the only one that's like slightly different is living bible which says what events will signal your return but no bible i found translated by scholars uses the word presence which i noticed the new world translation that i read first of all read and i'm just a bit puzzled at that because um no oh, that's it that's excellent Perusia is used to describe the physical presence of Jesus. Um, that's what I find difficult. And especially as that relates to the 1914, kind of the sign of the times um, question, that, that question that the disciples posed to Jesus, when will, you know, what will be the sign of your coming? and your parousia or presence. Um, I'm obviously not a, a Greek scholar, uh, so I'm dependent on those that, um, you know, have done the translate. Could we shut the video down? And... Okay. No you, were, you, were, you were breaking up. No problem. Can you understand me a little better now? If you could shut down the video, please. Oh, okay, let me stop my video. Yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you. Does that work a little better? Doesn't bog up your lines? Um, no I, can, I can hear you fine now, yes. Excellent. Yes, and, and I understand that uh, just, just from, a, from a high level, that understanding of to come, um, there's different Greek verbs that are utilized there, uh, as I recall. I'm just jumping into my translation uh, on my phone, because uh, then my footnote will help me there. But as I recall, just top ahead, um, the, the coming and the parousia are two different kind of understandings, if you will, of the Greek words that were being utilized. And that was Matthew 24. The, the Greek word is... And, I, and I'm terrible on pronunciation. Parousia. That's okay. You're, you're, or parousia. I'm not word critical at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that word, parousia, is used mm -hmm. by the Apostle Paul at 1 Corinthians sixteen seventeen. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus, Fortunus, and Achaeus, because they have made up for your absence. Well, parousia, the coming of Stephanus, Fortunus, and Achaeus, chaos is talking about their physical coming not not coming as a spirit it's talking about their literal coming in 1 corinthians 16 17 um yes yeah, so i'll just read a little uh, study note from our translators on that on that thought where uh, is the could you give me the full reference for that yeah on matthew 24 3 right so do you have the digital version of um, that gray Bible? Um, no, no, but I can go to jw.org and... Okay, because there is a little footnote there off of that verse that talks about that Greek word. Uh, I only know it as parousia. Uh, again, you know, pronunciation notwithstanding. Yeah, I'm sure you're uh, but correct. Here's the, here, here's the note that it says on that thought of that word presence. Um, the Greek word parousia in many translations rendered coming, as you identified, literally means being alongside. It refers to a presence covering a period of time rather than simply a coming or an arrival. This meaning of parousia is indicated at Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, where the days of Noah before the flood are compared to the presence of the Son of Man. At Philippians 2.12, Paul used this Greek word to describe his presence in contrast to his absence. So the conclusion of that study is, rendered from the Greek word, oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's not the point. That's, that's a different word. Um, so parousia then likens it more to a presence as opposed to uh, an absence, uh, like they're around or alongside. That's that's kind of the um, study notes to that verse for us. So how that would relate to the first question of uh, Matthew 24, 3, and then going on even down into verse 30 
uh, where it talks about the sign of the Son of Man, uh, that wouldn't be the same as the sign of Jesus' presence or parousia there at 24.3. That refers to a a different... What were the two scriptures that you, you quoted from your reference Excellent, yes. Um, so Just the give them to me slowly. Okay, uh, so the first one is Matthew 24, 3. Yeah. Uh, that, that is the question, right? Yeah, uh, you read sign. the note and you quoted two scriptures. Yes, one was Matthew 24, 37 to 39. But in the days of Noah were... But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming, same Greek word, parousia, uh-huh. of the Son of Man be. Yes. So it's a literal, physical return to this earth. Do you mean as a human? Would that be your understanding as a human? or Yes. yes. Okay. And that's probably where our understandings are, um, you know, a bit different. Yes. For for us, our understanding is that um, you mentioned 1914, so you're familiar with that. That mm, Jesus began. You mentioned 1914, not 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 me. I'm happy to go on to that, but you actually mentioned 1914. Oh, oh I was I was referring back to um, your question on Zoom. Right. Oh, well, I, okay. I can't remember earlier, what I typed. Today. I can't remember what I typed in. Um, what was, the, what was the not second not verse that you 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 mentioned? Because Philippians two twelve. Thank you. And that was that was where Paul used that same Greek word. I'll read from verse eleven, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only. But now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Perusia is presence here, but it's referring to his physical presence. Yes, in he, contrast to his absence. Yes, in contrast yes. to his absence, yes. he is present Agreed. with them, but he's present, Paul is saying he's present with them physically. He's not present with them as a spirit. Okay, and so help me understand what. Um, do you, where is like the, the the point of contrast from your standpoint? Whether Jesus is coming physically as a man to Earth, or whether he would be coming in an invisible presence, which is what we understand. Well, as I understand it, when Perusia is used in other instances, it's referring to a physical coming. I agree, it can mean to be alongside somebody but it's always physical it's never non-physical because at 1 corinthians sixteen seventeen, paul says i rejoice at the coming that's perusia of stephanus fortunus and achaeus because they have made up for your absence so it's a contrast between coming and being absent but the, the coming of those three men is a physical coming they're they're going to be physically there they're not going to be there as spirits. Okay. Um, another instance is Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse six to seven. I won't read the whole thing. God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. So Perusia there means that Titus actually physically travelled in his physical body to be alongside Paul and Paul's companions. Um, What else can Perusia mean there? It's translated coming twice, but it's a physical coming to to be with Paul. And there are many other instances like that. Um, could, I, could I ask, when you say the second presence of Christ is 1914, what exactly do you, do you, do you mean by that, Rob? Do you, do you mean, where is this presence? Is this presence in heaven or on earth or, or both or somewhere else? Where is this second presence of, of Christ? Well, excellent. So, so just a, like a quick little thumbnail answer of our understanding yeah. is... Um, that 
in fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus gave to in answer to his disciples there at Matthew 24. Um, corroborate that with other prophecies that point to 1914 as, as when he began ruling in heaven, ousted Satan, and cleansed the heavens, prepared a place, if you will, for uh, the, the kingdom rule to begin. Then all the evidence since then of the wars, pestilence, disease, earthquake, those types of things would give evidence to us here on earth that he had indeed begun ruling as king, had acted in the invisible realm, and was now present. That would be the parousia part of Matthew 24, 3. The coming portion of Matthew 24, 30 is at the time of the Great Tribulation when he would come, he would gather the last remaining ones here on earth that would be serving with him as kings and priests in heaven. And then there would be a direct intervention into humankind's affairs as he rendered judgment on earth. Uh, that's kind of like a, a quick little thumbnail of what we understand has taken place from 1914 when he began ruling as king, occupying that office in heaven. There's this invisible presence or parousia. Where? That's my question. Coming. That's my Absolutely. question. I just Robert. wanted where? to kind of sum up the, uh, um, you know, our understanding. But where is that presence? You say it, do, it doesn't mean coming, because I would say it is Christ coming from heaven to this earth. But you say it means presence. It's an invisible presence. presence. So my question is, where is that invisible presence? Is it from in heaven? heaven? Is from it on he the earth? Be, he would Both be or somewhere? Yeah, he would be in heaven, and we would see the evidence here on earth that that's taken place. That we're in that time, that segment of time of the prophecy being fulfilled. So... The prophecy, and what will be the sign of your presence, you say that is in heaven? No, the sign would be evident here on earth. I apologize uh, if that wasn't clear. The, the evidence of the sign, all those, uh, it's a composite sign, so all of those different elements, I think there's like 24 of them, um, would, would be evident for us as humans to be able to say, yes, we are living in this time of the last days that of this system of things that Jesus prophesied. I'm, I'm still trying to understand you, um, Rob. So you're saying the sign of his presence is on earth, whilst at the same time Christ's presence is actually in heaven. Is, is that no. it, or have I misunderstood? Um, the sign of the presence would be here, yes, Christ would be in heaven. That's what I said. Yes. Yeah. Well, we don't see any evidence uh, in heaven. I mean, that's not visible to us. So you say that Christ was present in heaven in 1914. Well, after after he he ascended from the five with the 500 witnesses there. Um, that's my been in heaven since then. That's that's my point. Christ ascended to heaven. Yes. At his ascension, Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. Yep. It, 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 I mean, you say it's 33 CE. I don't wish to quibble over dates. It would probably be, I'd say, about 28, 29, possibly 30. Um, but whether it's 33 CE uh, or, or not, I don't wish to quibble about that. That's when Christ ascended to heaven. But you then right. say that Christ has been present. He was present in heaven in 1914. Well, that's... It, 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 you see, if Christ ascended to heaven in 33 CE, then it's nonsense to say um, he was present in heaven in 1914. Of course he was. He's been present there for almost 1900 years. It doesn't make any, with respect, it doesn't make much sense. Yeah, well, and, and I can understand that. And here's here's what I would offer for a point of clarity, is that that phrase, coming or presence, means... Also, like if he's turning his attention, um, putting a focus or becoming actively involved in the affairs of Earth, which began in 1914 to our understanding. And he's getting involved in the affairs of Earth as a spirit mm -hmm. Correct. who's in heaven. Correct. Where does Perusia ever 
and don't go to Matthew 24, go elsewhere. Where is Perusia ever used of a spirit getting involved in something somewhere else? I mean, just just coming at it from from our conversation, I would have to do research to, yeah. uh, you know, to try to give a, a, a better answer to you on that. Um, but let's see if I can find something relatively quickly for you that might. Because provide. you know, when I when I look through the New Testament, Perusia or parousia i am dyslexic so i have terrible trouble with pronunciation sometimes um that greek word and i'm obviously like yourself not a greek expert i try to rely on people i try to read what people a lot more knowledgeable than me have to say on the topic that word is constantly <laughs> used <laughs> it's that word's constantly used of people in the new testament particularly paul for instance and it's referring to their their body. I mean, it's used presence. Parousia is used as presence in Second Corinthians ten ten, right? But it's referring to his physical presence. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence, parousia, is weak, and his speech of no account. So, I don't see how this word parousia can be applied to a spirit in heaven who's doing actions here on earth. I mean, I, I find that a, a little tenuous, unless you can show me an example in the Greek where parousia is used, or parousia is used in that way. Um, there's one other question. You, you just, use... just, doing a, just, just doing a quick thumbnail, and again, you know, obviously it's, for, from our perspective, it's not, uh, I would have to do more research to provide some substantiation and kind of assemble, you know, with some scriptures. But just to give you an idea, there's a, there was an article, and I remember this because this is one I just said kind of early on in my studies. Um, the Greek word there, parousia, meaning presence, how it would apply, and even some of the Hebrew utilizations of it. Um, let's see. You see, I don't think the yeah, word can ever be applied. Josephus and lexicon concordance of English and Greek, and I would have to go, kind of read that a little bit more closer to, I, to I, comment. Yeah, I don't think the word is ever used of somebody in one location who's doing action as a spirit in another, well, in another location. But how can Christ do action as a spirit on earth if, if Christ is in heaven? If Christ is in heaven and he's not omnipresent... And the insight in the scripture book says Jehovah is not omnipresent. So if Jehovah's not omnipresent, Jesus can't be omnipresent. So if Jesus is in heaven as a spirit, how on earth can he be doing stuff on earth when he's in heaven? He he can't because he's not omni omnipresent. Do, do, do you see and my that problem, like sir? With your, with your study, I can definitely see the um, the paradox that that yep. places for you. Um, so you. you know, you, you I, again to provide you a satisfying answer i would have to do a little mm -hmm. bit more research myself because yes. i can't swing this from the cuff i'm like i said yeah. i'm not a greek scholar and i'm dependent yeah. on assembling the facts for my own faith as yeah. well right it, it wouldn't be wise to swing it from the cuff with me believe me um no no <laughs> um you say that christ's presence is from 1914 yes that is our understanding. But it, it, originally it used to be 1874. You are aware of that. Russell taught the second presence of Christ was 1874. Yeah, I read some of the studies of scriptures when I first started yeah. studying. That was changed about 1930. Um, roughly 1930 is very complicated um, because there were some literature before that pointed to 1914 then he went back to 1874 then he went to 1914 for definite in 1930 but then the watchtower started publishing some of the older books so they were promoting both dates is it correct to say the actual date is october 1914 um i, d I don't think that we're absolutely dogmatic on that it makes makes absolute sense in the calculation of um, the seven prophetic times, if you're familiar with that prophecy and its calculation, 
And that's where the October 1914 it, would come exactly. from? Exactly. It is October 1914. But the First World War didn't start in October 1914. And the First World War wasn't the biggest war, the biggest killing in human history. I think it was the fourth. So there were two wars before the First World War that killed more people than the First World War. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, one was a yes. Mongol invasion of China where they literally killed everyone. Um, so there were two wars that killed slightly more than the First World War. Um, well, but the First World War... Well, let, me, let me flip the script a little bit and just ask you a quick question, because obviously you're, you're well-versed in studying... Yeah, but I haven't, made, made, I, I haven't made my point. The First World War actually started in July 1914 for Austria-Hungary. Right. Yeah, and for Britain was fired. and for Britain and Germany and well certainly Britain and France it was August early August 1914 that it started so you know if if this presence of Jesus has to marry up with the first world war then it's out by a couple of months because the first world war started in late July 1914 not in October and 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 also, First Corinthians eleven, twenty five and twenty six says that we are to celebrate the Lord's um, death till He comes. Um, in this manner, He also took the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Till He comes." So w when the Lord returns, we're to stop celebrating the Lord's Supper. So if, if Christ's presence did happen in 1914, you need to stop celebrating the Lord's Supper. You need to stop breaking bread and passing wine because that's supposed to cease at Christ's return, you see. And, and I understand your point. Obviously... You, you know well enough then from your, your research with us that our understanding of that coming that's being referred is when he comes on kingly glory to grab, uh, to gather the rest of the anointed that are here on earth to rule with him in heaven and execute judgment on the framework of humankind system and its ruler, which we believe is Satan the devil. Um, that time is a future time as part of the Great Tribulation. So we anticipate, or our hope, or based on our understanding of the scriptures, is that he will come in a literal and a invisible slash material in the, in the sense that we will see the effects and understand the effects of him coming to render that judgment. So this is a set. And that is at a future point, and the sign or the, the parousia was evidence leading up to his followers being able to have visible evidence that he was present, albeit invisible, and was going to be coming in a literal fashion at a later date. So, are you saying that there's a separate event after 1914? when Christ returns to this earth? Or, or are you not yes. saying that? Yes, yes. No, that, that, that is what's being said during the Great Tribulation. Yes. That is our understanding. It's amazing how this parallels dispensational theology, which is the um, standard American um, evangelical position. Um, they believe in two peoples of God. One goes to heaven, the church... Uh, through an event called the rapture the jews live on the earth and they also believe in a doubled barrel second coming christ comes back first invisibly called in an event called the rapture and then three and a half or seven years later depending on which dispensational school you belong to he comes back a second time at the second coming so there's two second comings there's two peoples of god and there's two hopes one go to heaven, one go to earth. I'm just amazed how this sort of parallels dispensational theology. I have had an idea that for some time that Rutherford just borrowed um, what was around him um, from the American evangelicals and adapted it, obviously with a couple of changes. I'm not saying Jehovah's Witnesses are dispensational. They're not, but they've yeah, surely adapted... 
the distinctions and understanding Pardon? and why. Yeah. At this um, return of Jesus, will he come back as a spirit? Is he coming back to this earth as a spirit, or will he come back in the same physical body that everyone saw him in? That he wrote. Um, our understanding from from Revelation and the way he indicated it to his uh, disciples there in Matthew twenty four uh, would be that it would be an invisible. Uh, Aspect. He would be coming in his kingly glory, which is he he rules from heaven. So, um, not as a as a flit, a literal flesh and blood man like you and I. I mean, Revelation one seven says that every eye will see him. Um, behold, he is coming with clouds. This is prophetic of an event that hasn't happened, and mm -hmm. every eye will see him. And they also who pierced him. So it must be the son because the father was never pierced nor was the Holy Spirit, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Um, it says every eye will see him, you see. And and then we have to consider, you know, all of the different points of scriptural reference, and the majority of them all suggest a coming on clouds and heavenly glory, more of an invisible than a do we see the effects yes just like we see the effects of wind but we don't see wind uh, we would see the evidence of it now whether or not the sign of the son of man um that's indicated as one of the stages of the great tribulation include you know angelic and spirit creatures becoming visible so that we can literally see them mm -hmm. um there, there's nothing that in the scriptures that that we've considered that would have caused us to be dogmatic on that point whatsoever. Sorry, I I I, I was looking um, I was looking at the text. Could you just say that last mm -hmm. bit again, please, Rob? Sorry. Just that there's no um, there, there's nothing in the scriptures that would cause us to be dogmatic that it that Christ would be visible, you know, materialized spirit creatures to where we could see them or not. Well, I don't we believe would, that. Christ will, uh, I believe Christ will appear as a man, I believe Christ is a man now, and when he appears, he, he will appear as what he is, he has two natures, he's perfect human humanity, he's a man, um, not just with a body of flesh, but a human soul or spirit, and he is also divine, he also shares his father's very nature, Hebrews 1.3, Philippians mm -hmm. 2, 5 and 6. So Christ is also, I would believe, fully God, fully man. Um, there is a verse that talks about Christ appearing in the last days. Um, it's got a, a complicated Greek word with my pronunciation, apokalupsis, apokalupsis. Uh, terrible pronunciation. What, what's the verse? It's 1 Peter 4.13. 1 Peter 4.13. The word means to reveal... So you would, if an artist makes a statue, then you would cover the statue with a cloth. We, we do it today with, with paintings and statues. Uh, someone gives a talk, and then the painting or the statue is revealed, and you remove the cloth to reveal the statue at its, called its unveiling. Um, and so that's the meaning of this word, apocalypsis. Um the word is used with the meaning of pulling a cover off a statue so everyone can see it. Okay, it means disclosure, dis disclosure, unveiling, removing the cover. But the context is you make a statue, you cover it, and then you apocalypsis, you remove the, the cloth to reveal the statue. And that word is yes. used at 1 Peter 4.13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed so the use of this greek word here makes it absolutely apparent it's going to be a f visible coming that all hum humankind will see just as revelation 1 7 says every eye will see him not every eye will see his works or every eye will see his the the effects of the miracles that he will do no every eye is going to see him Every eye is going to see Christ. And the Bible is insistent that at the present time, Christ is, is a man. Christ is called a man post-resurrection several times in the New Testament. 
Are, are you aware of that? I I am, and I and I hear your points. Um, and while I didn't recognize the the Greek word that refers to Revelation, I re, I recall the illustration. Uh, so appreciate you you sharing that. Um, I mean, uh, clearly, you know, we, we we have some some misunderstandings or you know maybe disagreements of our understanding on mm-hmm. the, the physical nature or the spirit nature of his return uh, and the timing of those. Well, c- could we agree that if Christ is recorded in the New Testament 20, 30 years post-resurrection, if Christ is called a man post-resurrection, then he's going to be a man at his return at his second coming that will be after Armageddon he will still be a man um, that's that's not uh, that's not how you know one I personally or you know we as Jehovah's no, Witnesses no no, uh, no no what I'm saying is yeah. if I could prove to you from the Bible that Christ yeah. 20 years and 30 years post resurrection is called a man then that would settle it Christ would have to be a man now because there's no well, verse context dictates that um, Robert, right? I mean, well, one if Timothy if two five about someone in the past when they're when they're no, invisible no. now. No, 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 no. One Timothy two five is written about thirty years after Christ's resurrection. Now, I was corrected on this verse by a very clever lady who 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 knows the Greek, and she said the verbs come from verse four, not from verse five. Um, who desires all men to be saved? and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's all present tense. The verbs are present tense. Verse 5, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, that's anthropos in Greek, no other has to mean man, Christ Jesus. So Christ is called a man in the present tense. 1 Timothy 2, 5, 30 years after his resurrection. It doesn't say he was a man and he's now become a spirit creature. He is, present tense, a man. 1 Timothy 2 5, 30 years post resurrection. But he's also that man who gave himself a corresponding ransom, which means that man died. Yes, he died, but he resurrected in the same body that he died in. Well, he did appear to the disciples and, um, and to the women of the time in a materialized body, agreed. No. They didn't recognize them, so it wasn't the same body. No, you need to prove. One would, what, what, what do you mean by a materialized body? Meaning that as a spirit creature, he had the capacity to materialize into human form. Did he do that on each separate occasion? For instance, when he appeared to the women the very first time, was that body number two? And then he, then when he appeared the second time to the disciples, was that body number three? And then when he appeared on my, the Emmaus Road, was that body number recorded. four? Oh, pardon? To my knowledge, that's not indicated for us. Well, could could you answer the question? How many physical bodies did Jesus manifest post-resurrection? Um, that That isn't indicated. How many times he manifested himself is recorded for us, but whether it was a different body or not is not. Well, you need to answer that How question. You, you would need to answer that, that question. You would need to answer that question. If you're going to say the entire Christian church for 2,000 years is wrong, you're, you're entitled to come to that opinion. But the onus is on you to say the Christian church is wrong and this is what actually happened. And you go into all the details. You, you, you see, there's lots of religious people who will point the finger at other groups And they'll say the Protestants are all wrong. They're all in apostasy. The Catholics are all in apostasy. Everyone's in apostasy except for our little group. When you ask them questions about their belief, they haven't thought any of it through. Now, if Christ... Are you you suggesting that about Jehovah's Witnesses? Is that 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 the conclusion of your point and observation? I'm trying to be polite. But no, no, it's, but yes. it's fine. I haven't insisted on anything. I've only answered yeah, yeah, your questions yeah. in reference Jeho- to Jeho- belief in general or mine personally. So I have, um, there's yeah. there's no dispute there, and I haven't um, disparaged any other belief systems um, uh, in the doing. I have spoken to many Jehovah's Witnesses in the UK, 
and no one has been able to answer this question. If Christ, you say he rose as a spirit, yeah, that's your position. That's our understanding, correct. And then, as a spirit, he manifested different... He manifested fleshly bodies... They weren't the body that died on the tree. They were new fleshly, they were new fleshly bodies at various occasions, such as to the women outside the tomb, to his disciples on the Emmaus Road, in the upper room by the Sea of Galilee, um, uh, and then at the Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. I, is that correct? You know it is. Right. When he manifested those bodies, did he remain as a spirit creature or did he stop being a spirit creature each time he manifested those bodies? Uh, well, our understanding from other materializations in the Bible is they were spirit creatures. They remained spirit creatures while they materialized in human form, served their purpose, and then dematerialized. So that's how we understand the angelic visitors to uh, whether it was to Mary, to Abraham, to yeah. Daniel. Uh, so you know the other accounts in the Bible. So you're saying that Jesus remained as a spirit creature each time he manifested. It would have been about ten to twelve times. I'm not sure of the exact number. Each time he manifested a physical body which wasn't the body he died in, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, he remained as a spirit creature. Is that, is that right? Correct. And so do you, do you understand it to be different? Well, that would mean you have two different Jesuses. You have a physical Jesus in one location, and then you have a spirit Jesus in another location, because remember, your spirit Jesus is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at the same time. Yeah, um, I don't see how the two connect, but um, well, I hear your point. You have one one Jesus in a certain location on earth, that's the physical manifestation of Jesus, and then you have a spirit Jesus who's in a different location. The spirit Jesus can't be in the physical Jesus no, because we're, you we're call that demonism. That <laughs> yeah, we, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the, the, the spirit and the physical are occupying two different spaces and positions in time right do um, they occupy the same nothing. position do, do they occupy right. the same position because jehovah's that's witnesses call yes. but jehovah's witnesses call that demonism you say when a spirit indwells a physical body you teach that that's demonism yep. you say okay. that's so, what the demons do so you can't okay. take that position so, so let, let, let's pause because we've gone a, we've, we've gone quite a bit astray from all right you know where our conversation started okay and i clearly don't want to get into a debate with you and just okay you know dispute scripture or our understanding you're clearly a man well versed in the bible and have your faith as you understand we do as well so unless there was something that uh, we could help you with i really don't find uh, where this conversation uh, can be a benefit to yourself or myself in continuing. Um, because I'm not going to debate with you or, or try to outprove or um, you, you know how my faith is built. You know who I look to right. as, right? So you understand that on a personal level and you understand on a personal level as a man of faith that my goal in serving my God and King is to bear witness about the tr truths as I have learned them. And you likely feel a very similar sense of commission, but you've done your research. You know what Jehovah's Witnesses think and believe. And if you choose not to, to believe it, that is completely in line with your free will. Um, and I want to be respectful of that and in no way show disrespect by just trying to argue or like I even mentioned earlier and you agree by trying to give you answers off the cuff by bouncing around uh, in scripture. I am more than happy to share you snippets of, you know, kind of like the thumbnail of what our belief is and you know our study program for helping ones to build their faith in that. And if that's not your wish, then um, what we have to offer isn't isn't for you. And we totally respect that, Robert. Do, 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 you, do you think, Rob, that if Jehovah's Witnesses get the resurrection of Jesus Christ wrong, if they're mistaken in that, then the whole religion is worthless. 
it cannot be of Jehovah God it has to be a false religion if you get the resurrection wrong I mean we're warned at 1 Corinthians 15 I think it's verse 12 or 13 somewhere around there uh, that if we get the resurrection of Christ wrong our faith is in vain uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 and if Christ is not risen then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also vain uh, yes and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if indeed if in fact the dead do not rise so your point is absolutely valid and I 100% agree with you and I would say that you you and I both have a responsibility to ourselves as well as all the lives that we affect um, to try and get it right but but Jesus and make our choice based on our our study right and but, how but, we build our faith but Jesus said that he he wasn't a spirit he said he he rose up in a body of flesh and bones he says it's I myself and he in Luke 24 39 he says behold my hands and my feet that he is I myself then he says handle me and see because he wants them to feel the marks of crucifixion in his body because obviously the body that he's appearing before them in is the same body that died on the tree that's why it has the marks of crucifixion he doesn't say this is a manifestation of me I'm really a spirit creature and I'm manifesting this fifth or sixth or seventh temp temporary body he says behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself so this is Jesus himself appearing before them handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have and when he had said this he showed them his hands and his feet he, he goes on the Bible is repeatedly going on about the Jesus's hands and his feet and he's saying handle my hands and feet in John 20 he tells Thomas to put his hand into his side because he's tried to show them that he's risen up in the same body that he died in this is not a temporary manifested body number six or number seven that he's created well, on a know, temporary we, temporary basis yeah so we we agree to disagree on our conclusion of that as well as the parallel events right okay do you think that Jesus, prophetically speaking in John 2, 19 to 21, is telling his disciples prophetically that he's going to rise up on the third day from the dead in the same body that he died in? He says, Jesus answered and said to them, John two nineteen, destroy this temple, which is, as you know, a figure of speech, and in three days I will raise it up. Three days means the, three days in the, t in the tomb. Verse 20, the Jews are going to totally misunderstand him because the Jews, like dispensationalists, they take things literally. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And the next verse talks about this being the context being the resurrection. So destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 19 is the prophecy. Verse 21 is explained, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And body there is singular, by the way. It's singular because Jesus didn't manifest numerous temporary manifested bodies post-resurrection. There's only one body, and that's the body that so died on the tree that has the marks of crucifixions in its in, in his hands and in his feet. So is your is your belief that Jesus is is still a, a literal, physical, perfect man living on earth? Not living on earth, no. I didn't I didn't say that. No, I'm asking. I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand where your conclusion of this would would be. Well, I try to. Um, I mean, I don't always get things right, but I, I try to base mm -hmm. my belief on on the Bible. I've shown you one Timothy two five, where Christ is a man. He's not on earth at the present time. He's in heaven. Um, but Acts seventeen thirty one is another verse, which says that Christ is a man. Now, this is written about 15 years, possibly 20 years. I'm not a biblical scholar, so I can't give an exact date, but it's about 15 to 20 years after the resurrection. Um, and Luke records Paul saying, on Mars Hill, and I've actually been on Mars Hill. In fact, I've just picked up right now, which I could show it to you. I could just turn the video on briefly to show it to you. Uh, I own a little bit of Mars Hill because I went to Mars Hill many, many years ago. Awesome. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. 
Yeah, I can. My my dad was there. He um, sent me a picture of that bronze plaque of of Paul's um, speech there at the Areopagus. There's there's some steps up to Mars Hill, and obviously, being two thousand years old, the rock is like very wet and slippery, and so it's barred to the public. And there's a horrible metal spiral staircase to go on top of Mars Hill. But I went there um, briefly. And uh, I, I took a little rock away with me, so um, I've got a little bit of Mars <laughs> Hill. Um, it says in Acts 17.31, Because he has appointed a day on which he, that's the Father, will judge the world in righteousness by the man, right, it says man, whom he, that's the Father, has ordained, an obvious reference to Christ. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So, post-resurrection, Christ is called a man. It doesn't say he was a man, because this is looking prophetically after Armageddon to the judgment, when the Father is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man, that's Christ, whom he has ordained. And then it says he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Well, the antecedent in the sentence to raising him from the dead is man. So it says two things. Christ rose from the dead as a man, but at the very end of human history, after Armageddon, when we get to the eternal state, it will be as a man that the Father is going to judge the world by the man Christ Jesus, by Jesus Christ, who's called a man. So prophetically, after Armageddon, Christ is going to be a man according to Acts 17.31. And I can see how you get to that con- conclusion you know with, with with your logic and i appreciate that and uh you clearly understand that you know we don't share the same conclusion what what evidence do, being... do you have that christ is not a man now well to give you a a cliff note answer uh when we go into all of the prophetic revealings the Apostle John wrote in Revelation, yeah. all of the activities of what Christ would be doing post-resurrection, uh, all of them suggest that he would be doing so from heaven, not from, not from earth. That's our conclusion, right? Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I get there. Obviously, that's a longer discussion, <laughs> um, and I would have to do research to assemble all of you know all of the study to support that but that is the conclusion of the matter that's like the short answer i i i would agree M- most of revelation is written uh covering the period of the church age and christ at the present time is in heaven christ is not on earth right now christ is going to return to this earth at armageddon and revelation chapter 5 verse 10 says they shall reign on the earth so I believe the saints of God will reign on the new or the restored earth. Who knows, maybe that will include different planets in different solar systems. I don't honestly know. But it does say the eternal state is going to be on this earth. It's it's epi, the preposition's epi, it's, it's upon this earth. Mm-hmm. Revelation 5, 5, 10. Um, there's plenty of examples of, of, of Christ being in heaven at uh, the present time. Um, okay. So then we're agreed on that point, right? That we're we're agreed, and maybe where the the difference is is how he's going to return uh, at Armageddon. And if I understand you correctly, um, you understand that he's going to come in a physical presence as a man of flesh and blood. And my understanding would be that he's coming as a spirit with his angelic forces and his 144,000 co-rulers. Okay. As a king ruling from heaven. That's that's probably where our point of understanding uh, goes different. Would you agree? I think I, I, understanding you correctly? <laughs> uh, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I forget your reference to the book of Revelation. Uh, I went on one of my rants, I'm afraid. And I, I kind okay. of um, forgot your yeah, exact I, point that you, that you were making, and which I should have been responding to. I apologise. Um, what were you saying? 
you said something not, about not Christ in I, heaven. Christ is ruling in heaven now. Yeah, I would agree with that. Christ yeah, is ruling so, so in, we, in in heaven now. Yes. I've I've no I've no problem with that. And the and gospel. Our, just our difference in understanding is when he comes at Armageddon to execute judgment. Um, that if I understand you correctly, and correct me if not, your understanding is that he's going to come as a literal, physical man of flesh and blood, and our understanding is that he would come as a spirit being with angelic forces and the 144,000 co-rollers. Um, I certainly would agree that Christ um, has a body of flesh and blood, but let me perhaps put some meat on the bones. He has a full human nature. He's not partially human. Okay, so Christ is a full human. He has a human spirit or a human soul, as well as a human body. And he is called the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15, round about verse 20, 21, 22. So he's the first to rise from the dead in a glorified human body. So it is a human body, but it's a glorified human body. And Christ also has a divine nature. So I don't believe that Christ is a man and just a man. I believe that Christ has two natures. He eternally, gotcha. fully and completely shares his father's nature. He is also a perfect human. He's he's not just a, a bag of bones with no human soul or spirit. Um, okay, and that's probably where where that 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 understanding is again diverges mm -hmm. a little bit in our uh, belief systems. Uh, when you read of Christ as the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven in Matthew twenty six sixty four. Do you believe that's a reference to the destruction of the temple in AD seventy or to Armageddon? Let, let me let me just read it. I'll read from verse sixty three. Matthew twenty twenty six sixty three. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure you by the living God, that you tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Verse sixty four. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, there's only two possible interpretations of that verse. I used to think, as a young Christian, it referred to Christ's second coming. Uh, I would now probably say it refers to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. But it's not a big deal. Um, both of those events are post-resurrection. One is more than 2,000 years after the resurrection, and the other one is uh, 40 years, roughly, after the resurrection. Christ is called the Son of Man. Now, you can't call a non-human spirit creature the Son of Man. Son of Man surely means a human being. What do you think this verse refers to, verse 64? Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will, future tense, see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Are those clouds of heaven, which the Bible calls, refers to judgment? Is that AD 70 or is that the second coming of Christ? So a couple things that yeah. just, again, by, by asking for a conclusive statement, you're asking me to give an answer top ahead, right? So... In, in fairness, you you have some of your thoughts already in verses assembled, and and I don't. Um, well, we understand. Well, we've actually uh, drifted. Uh, from, I, I, I know my faith, and I know my I know yeah. I know God's word, the Bible, because I'm a student of it also. Um, but I also want to assemble my expressions to you in a way that you know mm -hmm. garners you the respect for your study. Um, maybe fills in the gap if you don't know our our understanding or our belief and you want to reconcile that with what you understand um Actually, that's also why i want to be delicate yeah. also i guess you, i don't want to seem in yeah. a debate with you yeah. I, I guess you could say as a jehovah's witness this could possibly refer to 1914 unless you're Pastor Russell, in which you um, say it applies to the second presence of Christ in 1874, 
which was changed in 1914 and about 1930. But it has to refer surely to one of those events. It has to refer to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. It has to refer to that or to Armageddon in 1914, or it has to refer to the second coming of Christ, which hasn't happened yet. But, you know, who knows? It might happen in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Who knows? I, 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 I don't know the day and the hour, but it can't be that far off. Um, Christ is called yeah, the Son of Man, you see. Son of Man cannot mean a non-human spirit creature. It, it has to mean a man, a human being. And, and I agree, it, it has absolute reference to the time that he occupied as a human here on Earth. Um, and that is his reference um, quite consistently for lots of reasons that go back to, you know, the Garden of Eden as to why it would require him to come as a son of man and offer himself as a perfect sacrifice. Um, this sitting at the right hand of power, um, our understanding, as you may or may not know, um, is currently what we understand is following his ascension to heaven. He waited, allowing the times of the Gentiles or that seven Gentile times, the times of the nations, the, the appointed times of the nations, it's referred to in different ways, a period of time that even he identified was going well past um, the time he was here on earth that we understand ends in 1914 that he would be awaiting that point before he would take kingly rulership right so you apply this to 1914 uh, the, the gap of time that he would be sitting um, and then receive that kingly power in 1914 yes so he would be waiting from that time that um, they killed him and he ascended to heaven to 1914 as the the waiting uh, to receive that power okay yes well he's called son of man which has to mean a human being it can't mean a non-human spirit creature you you cannot call a non-human spirit creature son of man so so what is your is your belief is that he is some half spirit half human type of being or something we don't understand that's at a higher plane of existence what is what is your belief i take the standard position held by catholics protestants and orthodox for, for since since the first century you know the standard position held by all christians that jesus christ is god and man and that Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead in the same body that he died in. It was a physical resurrection from the dead. That's taught by Catholics, Protestants of all sects of Protestants, and the Eastern Orthodox churches, whether it's Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox. So I'm not some weird person with some loony, tuny no, belief no. that I've worked out not for myself. This not is what the Christian not at all. church. I'm trying to understand yeah. your your belief. Just this like is, I've shared mine, yeah, right? This is what the Christian church has taught for 2,000 years. If it's wrong, believe me, I'd really like to see you refute it and prove it wrong. <laughs> well, but, no, I, you know, I, I would my, actually my, my be... My role isn't going to be to, um, yeah. you know, just occupy a challenger kind of role. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't think I do any service to my fellow man, hmm. um, you know, or our conversation hmm. adopting that position. But... Um, I mean, are you an elder or a circuit overseer? Or I, I am an elder, You're an and, elder. I, and I have been one for for, for some time. So I am okay. familiar with the, even the clarifications of our understanding on many things. I am fascinated yeah. with Bible prophecy, so I'm a student. Um, just because I'm not answering off the cuff doesn't mean that I can't. Sure. Uh, sure. But I won't, and that's out of respect to you as well as my belief system and i want to understand what you believe not to minimize it not to criticize it uh, but to to help me frame any logic that might help you either reconcile or just absolutely not agree with the conclusions that we as jehovah's witnesses have come to mm. the position i i hold to is just the standard position held by christians for two thousand years <laughs> they disagree on baptism they disagree on uh, a, a number of points but on, on Christ's resurrection, that he rose from the grave uh, physically and bodily, uh, what I've said to you, Rob, um, that's what the Christian 
people, Christian scholars and Christian church leaders will have said for 2,000 years. So, you know, it is to your advantage to understand this position because if you can refute it and, and poke holes in it and show where it's wrong, then the next Catholic, Protestant, uh, Eastern Orthodox person that you meet, in other words, anyone <laughs> from any Protestant group or Catholic group or Orthodox group, um, you'll be able to show them where their position is wrong. So it is useful to learn what other people believe because you strengthen your own knowledge and your ability to defend your own belief. Uh, you do have to understand and I don't disagree, other... which is why I've actually devoted yeah. time that I don't have today. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, because, okay. because I care about people and I care about you personally. I don't, um, you know, I, I wouldn't even have ready access other than, than digitally to you. Um, okay. Well, you've got my details. You know, obviously, I would direct you to, to some of our friends that are there locally, but you mentioned you've talked to them extensively. Yes. Can, can I do what you just suggested? I, I think you know I can. Um, the manner in which I would do so uh, would be different than, than this forum, right? It would, let's stick to a topic, let's okay. both assemble our research, okay. then, we can, then we can have a, I can provide a satisfying Bible-based answer, much like, you know, you have your scriptures that you reference your points from, and I really appreciate that. I've um, really enjoyed hearing some of the connections that you're making. Um, obviously for me, the next point would be as well, if you were, you know, sincerely interested, well, then I'd be willing to make effort to, you know, show you some of the framework of our understanding. But it sounds like you've done quite a bit of work yourself that way. Um, so I don't know whether that would would be lost on you or not. And, you know, I look to you for that answer. I'm quite happy to speak again, Rob. Um, you've got my email. Uh, I can never speak on a Monday. Other days are fine. Obviously, I don't want to speak at sort of three, three o'clock in the morning UK time, um, sure. because I tether off a phone. It's it's perfectly fine, provided it's not between about four o'clock in the afternoon and about ten, ten o'clock UK time, because that's when all the kids go online and use the phones, and then mm -hmm. the internet gets very the very slow. It gets very slow between those hours. Um, I can stay up late, so midnight, you know, between 11 and midnight, it's usually fine. And in the mornings, UK time, it's fine, early afternoon. But when the kids leave school, that's when everything slows right down. It gets very slow. Yeah, and that's probably, that, that mid-afternoon is probably the best time. I'm an early riser. So... Um I'll tell you what, I will shoot a little synopsis of some of our um, kind of discussion points, and then you just let me know what's of interest to you to talk on another occasion, you, and then let's make an arrangement to, to do so. I, yes, that's, 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 that's fine. You choose a topic. What topic? I am very passionate about the Trinity, but maybe that's something you wouldn't want to, to, to look at, but... Uh, I believe oh, no, I'm, I'm, again, I, I, I come from California, and so you know met many people of, of differing faiths and all of them had you know we we all have our faith and our basis for how we got to our understanding and if we're willing to do a comparative uh, with with a sincere interest in learning further then i'm willing to invest time if it's just to like compare notes and debate then you know our, our i wouldn't i wouldn't sign up for that right um I have read Lesson 7 of Enjoy Life Forever, What is Jehovah Like? Paragraph 4 is titled Holy Spirit, God's Active Force. I would believe the Holy Spirit is personal. I believe I can prove that from, from the Bible. The Holy Spirit uses the pronouns I and me when he speaks, which something that's impersonal like the wind can't do. Uh, the Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a will. And the Holy Spirit has emotion. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. So I would say the Holy Spirit possesses the four aspects of personality. The Holy Spirit is not impersonal. The Holy Spirit is personal. Because the Holy Spirit possesses the four aspects of personality. Um, that's something I would be very passionate about. I'm very passionate about the Trinity. 
but I'll, I'll I'll leave it up to you Robert you've got my details so if you want to speak again you can always contact me excellent well thank you so much for for spending some time as well Robert um, nice to talk to you uh, and as you know we love finding individuals like yourself that you know love the Bible loves God's word and we're all seekers of truth uh, through our studies in it and uh, sometimes this is how we sharpen each other right okay all right that's Best fine friends. thank you Excellent. Thank you so much, Robert. You have a wonderful evening. It's quite late now. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> Bye. I imagine. Thank you for staying up late. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.